The counter's running. All right, good deal. <coughs> All right, let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to spend some time looking at your word, gathering principles from your word and applying them to our marriages. Lord, I pray that you will guide us tonight, help us to be honest and clear, <coughs> but show grace and kindness to one another. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all your love. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right. So, <coughs> now I've started talking, so now I'm going to start coughing, of course. Um, little bit of review to keep us going. Um, looking at <coughs> last month, in Genesis chapter 2, what problem did man have? And it was not leaving the toilet seat up. <laughs> what was man's problem in Genesis 2? He didn't have a spouse. He didn't have a spouse. Okay. <laughs> okay. He was and be huh? He was lonely. He was lonely. Because he didn't have a spouse, he was lonely, which means marriage then was God's solution to the problem. <clears throat> marriage, as we talked about and looked at last week, marriage then was designed by God from the very beginning to take two people and make them, we discussed, one flesh. One unit, one focus, one goal, one purpose. Um, yes, they, they do have to, you know, go separate directions for work sometimes. They have to do different things. But the goals, the focus, the everything should be pointed as if they were one person. It also, that principle helps dictate how we deal with each other. Um, I generally, okay, well, sometimes, okay, when I'm in a particularly odd mood, I might yell at myself, um, and say rude things about myself. But for the most part, we don't do that. We think highly of ourselves. We're impressed. We're proud of what we did. We don't say nasty things to ourselves. We certainly don't say things that intend intentionally hurt ourselves. We don't do things to intentionally hurt ourselves. And your spouse is one flesh with you. So the one flesh relationship in Genesis 2 um, leaves us with what definition, well, several other passages we looked at, but we came up with a, a definition of marriage that we're using for this study. Does anybody remember what that definition was? <clears throat> well, I'm glad I'm doing a review. <laughs> You guys, I mean, you, osmosis, you should have just known this, right? One man plus one woman. Uh, nice try. Close. <clears throat> okay, so the only people who haven't seen it um, gave a guess. Anybody else remember? Covenant of companionship. You're going to hear that over and over and over as we go through this whole study. Um <clears throat> It was actually a term used in a different book that I, I gathered information from, um, a, uh, a book by uh, Jay Adams. Um, but the, the primary book we're using is Paul Tripp. But Jay Adams' covenant of companionship term is just very important. Our marriages <clears throat> are about providing companionship to the person we married okay um <clears throat> galatians 6 what is your first responsibility to the sinner that you made that covenant of con that contract with what is your first responsibility to them okay pointing them to christ you're right there specifically in galatians 6 pointing out the sin pointing out their sin it, Let's say it a little happier, um, helping them deal with their sin, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a difference there between uh, pointing it out. Um, I, I understand what you mean. But <laughs> um, we have to point out their sin with a desire to help them, same as we would with any other Christian, okay? Now, this is, again, making the assumption that you married a Christian, okay, in this group, in this room. I'm making that assumption. 
okay? If we're, if you're in a group and if you're in a relationship with an unsafe person, all of this gets much more difficult. You still have a responsibility to point them at Christ, but for their salvation. <clears throat> so, uh, help them with being restored from their sin. All right, Matthew chapter six. This is kind of where we finished up last week. Um, what do we do first if we want a better relationship with our spouse? Have a better relationship with God. There you go. Bingo. Um, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That is where we have to start. I, I had my little diagram on the last one with the, the man and the wife and God in the middle. And as you're moving closer to God, you're moving closer to each other. Now, what I didn't do last time, <clears throat> I gave you that principle. But I really, other than seek ye first the kingdom of God, I didn't tell you why that works. Other than, I mean, Matthew says, seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added unto you. But how, when we apply that to our marriage, Fred, I am sorry I put your chair there, because I'm, oh, I'm right. like leaning back to see you here. I have a post between me and Fred. It's disconcerting. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, back on track. Um, how does that work? Why does that work? Why is it that putting God first, seeking God first, improves your marriage? And that is what we get into this week. Um, eventually, and I hopefully next month, we will get into the six uh, commitments. Thank you. Um, the six commitments that every married couple should be making to each other. We'll hopefully start those six commitments next month. But I want to lay a little bit more groundwork this month before we get into that. Um, what we, we have to answer, in order to answer the question, why does that work? We have to start with the question, what makes you important? Which is an interesting question, okay? Um, I've been in a lot of different groups. The question has been asked. I've asked it lots of different times. Um, for the, uh, for the sake of the fact that we have a video and nobody wants to give the wrong answer, um, I will give you some of the answers I've heard, okay, rather than making anybody give their answer. Um, oftentimes, especially men, what makes you important? Well, my job. I've, I'm increasing. I've done better. I've, I'm, I'm a supervisor now. I'm a foreman now. I'm, I'm improving in my job. What makes you important? My dad, I can fix anything. That made him important, okay? That's how men think a lot of times, what we can do. Not all women, most women, tend to wrap up their significance in their children. Well, my kid did this, my kid did that, my kid graduated from this, my kid, sometimes dads do, because I'll admit, one of my sons scored off the charts in their reading test this week, and I was, sort of off the track. Yeah, kind of. Silas. Anyhow, I was impressed, okay? But does that make me, is that the most important thing about me? Is it the most important thing about you? So, we're going to look at what makes you important. Let's start in Genesis chapter 1. What we're doing through this whole study because people tend to think, well, there's only a very, very few passages in the Bible that mention marriage and what it is. The truth of it is, the whole Bible talks about the relationship between man and God and the relationship between human and human, okay? Which means all of those principles that we apply from person to person also apply to our marriages if we will pay attention attention to it. So, Genesis chapter 1, you would think it'd be easy to find, for some reason I'm having trouble. All right, Genesis chapter 1, it's all those extra pages at the beginning. Shh, don't tell anybody, I have extra pages in my Bible. Okay, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, and again, for the sake of the video, I'll do the reading again tonight, just so the video, anybody watching the video can, can hear the reading very clearly. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man 
in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, some in our group here tonight might have latched on to, and they gave men dominion over the fish and the birds and the livestock. What makes me important? My ability to hunt and fish, right? Kenny agreed. Um, I at least got a halfway nod. Okay. But there's more, okay? Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. All right. Isaiah 43, verse 6 and 7. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Okay, now, obviously, Isaiah is giving a prophecy about Israel and things to come. But when we look at Genesis 1 and Isaiah 43, why did God make man? Why did he make us? Women too. He created him for his glory. For his glory. Isaiah makes it like super clear. Whom I created for my glory. Um, Genesis, it uses the term, we were made in his image. We, the only thing that truly makes us important is doing what God created us to do. We all know it. We've been talking about tools tonight, all right? A timing tool is not useful for hunting deer, okay? Um, induction timing gun, I know it looks like it, or the one I saw looked like a gun, okay? You're not hunting a deer with it. It's useless. But if it's used for what it was intended to be used for, it's important. Our importance is to be used for what God designed us to be. That's what honestly, and folks, I understand we live in a world, moms see all the other moms out there going, well, but did you see what my kid did? Oh, but my kid did that. And we get caught up in that. And, and us guys, we see, well, now, I, I've been at the company five years and I've had four promotions and the next one I'm is coming up any day now. Our sinful nature tends to think that way. Sometimes I've been at the company 10 years and I've survived. And that's all, it, you know, that's the only thing we're proud of, you know. Sometimes I've, I've seen that. Um, in our nature, we tend to think of the physical things as making us important. But what it really comes down to, and, and I'm kind of belaboring this because it matters in all of our lives. If children make us important, if we gather our significance from them, we sacrifice for them. If our job makes us important, we sacrifice for them, for that. If having a good retirement is, is, is what makes us important, we're going to sacrifice for it. Okay, now we're going to keep going. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap this around. I promise we're coming back to marriage. All right. Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. I, I, we don't have any great discussion -y type questions yet, but hopefully we'll get to some that, that are a little bit more than a one-word answer. I think we do. Romans chapter 1. Alright, Romans chapter 1, 
several verses. We're going to start in verse 20. I'm going to read down to 25. For his invisible attributes, attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their own hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. So what, working off of Romans there, what is the foolish thing that humans do? Worship other things. Worship things. Worship things. The way he phrases it is worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And when we invest, and let's see, I think... You guys have a box. I'm trying to think where it is. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right under this, you have a quote from the book I'm working out of for this. Being a worshiper means that you attach your identity, your meaning and purpose, your inner sense of well-being to something. You either get these vertically from the creator or you look to get them horizontally from the creation we we were designed from day one god built humans to glorify him <coughs> which means if we're not glorifying him we're going to glorify something somewhere along the line we may say no i'm not I'm not doing that. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just floating along. I'm just doing my own thing. I'm not glorifying anybody. What makes you significant? What do you tie your significance to? What do you tie your importance to? Well, now, my son, he won all those championships, and he got a full-ride scholarship. I Look what I did for him. Or is your significance simply based in... I'm a child, and, and we lose sight of the reality of things, okay? If I was the son of the King of England, I would probably say something about it, wouldn't I? I'd be over there going, yeah, I want my place, I want my title, I want my money, I don't want all of the hassle that goes along with it and the funny clothes, but... I, I, I'm going to say something about it, right? And everybody in here is a child, a favored child of the all-powerful king of all kings. He really is our father. And we don't talk about it. We don't take our significance there. Somebody says, what's important about you? And you don't jump up and say, ha, I'm a child of the king of kings, lord of lords. I am a Christian. Somebody wrote a song. Who is it? Matthew West sings it. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. It Truly powerful song if you pay attention to it. And how often when we introduce ourselves. Hey, I'm Jeff. Jeff Stutzman. I'm the new pastor here. I've been saying that for like four years now. So <laughs> it's wearing thin, but you know. You know what I just did? I technically tied my significance to my position. Look at me. What makes me important is my job. When I'm at when I'm up at Howardsville, hi, I'm Isaac's dad. <laughs> I'll claim Isaac. <laughs> no, it's you know you you introduce because of what you think is going to mean your significance to that person. But how often? 
if ever, do we say, Hi, I'm a Christian, saved by grace, child of the King. We don't think like that, do we? My your tailgate says it, but do you tell people? There you go. Good deal. Good deal. There you go. <laughs> Keep trying. Good deal. We've got to take our significance there. What? Are you? Oh, she's laughing at me. Okay. No, no, um, not you. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, fine. Whatever. I said he's very trying. Oh. Well, now you know why we're having marriage. Yeah. We know why Charlie so and Chris are here now. We're, everybody, in case anybody was wondering, we know that now. Uh, <clears throat> do we need privates? Okay, never mind. Um, anyhow, <laughs> what, and I guess I have, because I'm in a bit of a rambling mood, I was supposed to ask you guys to start filling in things that people draw their significance from. And I just like, Bro. Give us all the answers. Yes. Mm -hmm. But are there any answers I didn't get? What are some things? See, I gave the easy answers. What are some other things? I'll make it I'll make you give the hard answers. Position. Position. Okay. Intelligence. Intelligence. That's very good. A lot of people. Well, I'm the smartest man in the room. Where we live, location, location, location. Look at me, I've got a house on the river. I am important. Till it floods. Well, <laughs> then I have a house in the lake or in the river, but you know, there's that. Um, what else? What are some other things that people tie their significance to? What kind of car I drive? That was, I was gonna say cars. cars. Tie a lot of significance to cars. Education. Education. Yeah. Yes, a lot of people, I've seen that. Always got to get the next degree because that makes them important. Ever seen anybody who takes their significance from their spouse? I'm there. I, I'm, I belong to that one. You know? Now, there are some people that don't think of their marriage that way. I've occasionally been tempted to say, yeah. I'm hers. That's that's what that's what's important in here. I'm hers, and I know y'all are jealous. You know, I say things like that occasionally because sometimes I think it's true. Most of, all the time, I think it's true. Whoa, I stepped into that one. Watch out. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, back up. Edit a little bit. Trim. Yeah, I was gonna say somebody want to set up private lessons for us. <sighs> Whoopsie. Okay. All right. Well, let's warm in here now. <laughs> All right. What are some other things, though? Wealth. Wealth, just in general, or money? We do it with other things. Possessions, yeah. Possessions. Talent. 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 Yes. I can do this. Mm hmm. That. I'm an excellent cook. Yeah. This is my niche. Yep. Yeah. We all tend to do that. And the problem is, and the thing is, there's nothing wrong with being skilled at something. And, and you know, if somebody says, hey, I need somebody who's very skilled at body work, Charlie can say, well, yeah, I, you know, I know what I'm doing. I can get that taken care of for you. I know how to fix that. You know, somebody says, you know, I need somebody to teach my kid how to shoot a deer. Well, you know, hey, Kenny's, Kenny's got some skill there. He's got some talent. So let's talk to Kenny about that. There's nothing wrong with having those abilities. But if Kenny walks around and the only thing that he cares about and what he considers significant about him is the ability to hunt, then he's got a problem. I've got a problem. If, if I'm walking around and the only thing that's important about me is, well, I'm a pastor, then I got a problem. Okay, now, we're going to apply that marriage. So if we're, and the short answer is what, what they're, what the verses we read, Romans 1, 20 to 25, everything falls apart if we're worshiping the creator, creation, not the creator. And everything except for God has been created. So everything else falls into that. Whether it's your spouse, your kids, your car, your job, your money, your whatever, everything else, if that's your focus, 
then you've got a problem. And everything's going to start falling apart. Nothing is going to work the way it's supposed to. Okay? Again, like I said, we're taking broad principles of human nature and we're applying them to our marriages. If nothing is working right, it's not our marriage isn't going to work right either. Okay? We have to be worshiping the right thing. Now, um, we're going to look at three aspects of God that we should worship, and these three are specific to our marriages or can be specific to our marriages and how they work. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, there are lots of attributes of God. There are lots of things that we worship God for, but these three, um, honestly, the author pulled out and I agree with how he laid it out. These three can be helpful in our marriages. All right. Psalm 139. Psalm, no, Psalm of Proverbs. 139, 13 through 16. Okay. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance in, uh, I'm sorry, your, my, hmm, I'm going to try this again. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was nothing of them. What aspect of God are we worshiping? What is, what is the psalmist worshiping here? Creative. His creative ability. He is worshiping God as creator. Having a discussion with somebody just the other day talking about how much time when we pray do we spend in adoration of God's attributes. And we tend to, wow, God, you are love. You are just. You are holy. When was the last time you said, God, you put me together in my mother's womb. You made every fiber of me. We think because we see science and we can, you know, look in cameras and see things down there. We think, oh, the cells are regenerating and doing things, and it's a natural process. Nothing natural about it. God is actively creating a human inside of another human. And when was it? What? Supernatural. Supernatural is what it is. It's not just natural. It's supernatural. Only natural. Because God makes it work. We have to worship God as our creator. Now, here's the more difficult question. How could worshiping God this way affect your marriage? How can you apply that to your marriage? Make you more humble. Okay. Okay. Fred says, make you more humble. You're not you. God made you. Okay, good focus. What about, well, there's more. What else can we do with that? How else could we apply that? Makes you look at your spouse as a special creation. Mm -hmm. Makes you look at your spouse as a special creation. There are some things in every human that are just hardwired into them. Now, understand, and we talked about this last week. It does not absolve us of the responsibility of sin. Okay? Some of us can say, it's my hard wiring. I get mad real easy. And God says, mm, yeah, be angry and sin not. You don't get to claim, well, you made me angry, so it's okay for me to be angry. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God made me 
and we've already talked and joked about this tonight, so it's nice and easy. God made me to have a receding hairline, okay? We, we all looked at the wedding picture and we're like, wow, Jeff had hair back then. <laughs> um, you know, God made me that way. So now, all the ladies here have already said, because, yeah, pretty much all of us, except maybe Richard, are, are doing that receding hairline thing. Um, you know what? Your wife should not, wives, you should not be looking at him going, I wish he wasn't going bald. I really don't like dealing with this. Okay? Because, and, and the thing is, it's silly. And, and that's why I use it because it doesn't get me in trouble. Um, God made them that way. There, there's really nothing they can do about that. I mean, God made them that way. Um, uh oh. Now, if it's that funny, I'm going to start making you tell the tell tell everybody. Well, okay. <laughs> there are some things. There are some things. I guess. I guess. <laughs> There's that. There is that. There are some things. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. There you go. There you go. There you go. All was created by God. Worshiping God as the creator of your spouse. The other thing, we're not going to get into a lot tonight, but one of the things that we often find, and I've talked about it with a couple of different people lately, the vast majority of times I get irritated I'm not irritated at somebody's sin. I'm irritated at the inconvenience they caused me. And if I'm irritated at the inconvenience they caused me, and you know, you guys know, Heather's had some health stuff. And well, okay, when we were in the Philippines, okay, we we're in the Philippines, uh, first child born in Manila, and we were living in Manila. Good deal, great doctor. Nice, nice hospital. Um, the second child, we figure out we're going to have another baby. And we are six hours north of Manila and another two to three hours to get across Manila because the hospital's on the south side. And you know what? I could have been very frustrated with my wife. Here we are. I've got to drive you all the way down here, six hours down through traffic across Manila. Or I could say, God made you the way you are. And I'm going to honor God by letting you be who you are. Okay. There were some, go ahead. Yes. It was. And, and it was. honestly, the other part, you're very right. It was my fault too. Oh, uh, it's very true. Um, the other thing, and part of the reason we did that is um, the positive negative blood thing. Um, and so, you know, I could have been irritated. Well, if you didn't have that rare negative blood, we wouldn't have had this problem. Um, you know, I forgot to put that on the questionnaire before I married her. You know, excuse me, what's your blood type? Oh, psh, no, we ain't dealing with that. No. Um, okay. <laughs> But you know what? God made her exactly who she is and how she is. And I need to worship God. I need to honor God instead of letting her natural attributes frustrate me. Now, what are some that you can, you can, you can share what, what you've heard might frustrate somebody else? Obviously, you're not going to share what might frustrate you about your spouse. But what are some things... That might frustrate us. <laughs> Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Okay, seriously. There are some people that can be very, you know, I'm just sick of the sarcasm. But it's innate. But it's, it, it, it's innate and or learned. We'll get to the next part of that in a minute. Okay. What? Learn. Learn. Yeah. Okay. What else? Absolutely. Absolutely. That can honestly. Always late versus always on time. Yes. Or always early. Yes. 
Uh, anyhow, well, uh, <laughs> okay, we'll just keep moving. Um, <laughs> early versus late, detail oriented versus not detail oriented. These are things that we could get really frustrated about. And God says, um, dude, I made them that way. You need to honor me. You need to glorify God as the creator of your spouse. It also, as Fred mentioned, a very valid point, it makes you humble. I'm not a self-made man. God made me. Which leads us into the next one. And I just, because I can't stop talking, I gave you some of the answer. All right. Proverbs 19. Let's go there. Proverbs, Job Psalms, Proverbs 19. And no, we're not going to the verse that says it's better to live in the corner of a rooftop than with a brawling woman. We're not, we're not going there. Um, not tonight. We may pick it up later, but um, 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Okay. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Also grab Acts 5. You can keep it there in Proverbs if you need to keep your finger there in Proverbs if you need to look back at it. Acts chapter 5. Verse 39. All right. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. Okay, they were they were upset with the disciples and what they were doing. And somebody was saying, mm, you better be careful about that. All right. A little bit of context there. But what aspect of God? And these were just two verses that I pulled out. Do we see in these two verses? It's there through the rest of the Bible. But what do we see there? In control. Fantastic. What's the big word for that? Sovereignty. Sovereignty. You're looking at my notes, aren't you? No. Okay. She oh, said she wasn't. My eyes down here. <laughs> the sovereignty of God. Back to that, always had a little bit ago, learned behavior. Once years ago, I was in a class and somebody was, it was, a, it was an assignment that you had to give a detailed introduction of yourself. And I was in a little bit of a sarcastic mood. Um, so I came in, I wrote out this whole thing. And I started with, in case you want to know who I am, I am the product of a wannabe hippie that turned into a nurse and an Amish man who became an auto mechanic. And then he became a farmer, and then he became a Baptist pastor. So if you wonder why I am as strange as I am, you can look at where I came from. Okay. I, honestly, I, I love my dad. It, it cracks me up. To me, there is only one thing more ironic than an Amish guy turning into an auto mechanic. And that would be an Amish guy turning into an electrician. Um, it would just, you know, the irony of it would crack me up. Okay. Folks, you guys have, actually most of you, I think all of you maybe, have met my parents. They're awesome people. I love them to death. They're weird, folks. <laughs> they, are, they are weird, and they have created things in me that are just weird, okay? We are who God made us, and while some things must be overcome, we are a product of what we learned to be. And that's where we go with the sarcasm learned. There are some things we grew up with, okay? Um, 
Some people grew up in a sarcastic family, so that's how they deal with things. Um, one of Sam's friends is just very sarcastic, and I know her parents. Her parents are, whoops, I wasn't supposed to use that part. Anyhow, their parents are very sarcastic too, okay? It's what they are. It's what their child has learned to be. Now, if we're looking and worshiping God's sovereignty, how could worshiping God this way affect your marriage? Okay. Before you make plans in your marriage, submit your plans to the sovereign will of God. Okay. Very good. What else? He didn't make a mistake when he made my spouse. He didn't make a mistake when he made your spouse. And when your spouse went through all of the things they went through to make them who they are. Okay. We are the product of the things we grew up with. Okay. What else? The sovereignty of God. How could worshiping God's sovereignty affect, improve your marriage? Wow. You would both be looking at the same thing. Okay. Both looking at the same thing. Can you elaborate a little more? Together, okay. Searching God. Way. Okay, you you're coming together looking for God's plan to do things God's way, rather than both of you trying to do your own thing. Okay, good point. Good point. Well, it causes you to have patience because you realize you're not in control. Very good. Patience with that person. Patience in your marriage. What is you talk to? Ten marriage counselors, and like nine and a half of them are going to say, when par when when married couple come in for counseling, probably the most common subject that comes up as a stress. There's two that come up as a stress on marriage: kids, money. Kids and money are two of the greatest stresses on any marriage. And when you look at your money situation and you completely submit to God's sovereignty in it, that's where you're putting your priorities. There you go. What's your priorities? Submitting to God must be a priority. If you're both struggling with kids, okay? And again, I'm not speaking for me or anybody else in here, seriously, but are there families where 10 years down the road, one of the parents is saying, wish we hadn't made those kids. That was a bad idea. She talked me into that. He talked me into that. Maybe that hurts. Maybe, maybe that crosses your mind. But the question is, who was in charge? Who was the ultimate authority on whether or not you had those kids? God was. Because he is sovereign. Okay? So, hard though it may be, and th then you get into the, um, you know, you should be making decisions together and, not coming, you know, five years down the road and regretting that. But once it's done, folks, it's done. God's made that kid and you got to live with it. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have whispering going on. He's making sure it's quiet enough not to get on the video. <clears throat> My ears are a little plugged up so I didn't catch it either. So I get away with it. Um, Worshiping God's sovereignty can be huge in your marriage. When you realize the stress, the problems, the grief that you're going through is part of God's plan. Um, one of the things with us, okay, 
the last house we lived in in the Philippines. Everybody knows by now, Heather does not deal with roaches. And honestly, every house in the Philippines has problems with roaches. But this one had a little more than most. And I did a lot of spray and I did everything I could. But that upstairs bedroom, the roaches were one of the problems. And in the stress of that, we can turn that stress against each other, or we can submit to God's sovereignty in that. Because she's stressed out because of the bugs, and I'm stressed out because I can't get rid of the bugs. And then we're both poisoned because of all the chemicals I sprayed, um, <laughs> which I'm sure probably added to the stress. I don't know. But stress mounts up, and when stress mounts up in a relationship, are you blaming the other person? Well, if she wasn't so worried about bugs, then I wouldn't have to deal with this. Well, if he hadn't done this and we'd moved into that house, then I wouldn't have to deal with all these bugs. Do we turn that stress on each other or do we worship God for his sovereignty? God put us here. Now, yes, and, and there, are, there are two sides to a lot of this. We're focusing on one of it. Yes, our own sinful choices can be used by God. And sometimes it's our sin that put us in those situations. I know a guy who raised child number five was not his and child number six was his and he raised all of them. Okay. That was the product of a sinful choice, but God still used it. And so he had to face the sovereignty of God and say, nope, I'm going to raise this kid. Okay. Sovereignty of God. Worshiping God for his sovereignty can be very important in our marriages and helping them grow. All right. Last one of the three. Um, oh, wow, this is bad. So the video has this little counter so I can see that I've already gone 47 minutes. If I look up at the clock, I can think, I don't know what time I started, so it doesn't matter. But then I look down here and it says 47 minutes. Whoopsie. All right, Romans chapter 5. Got to get there. All right. Romans chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What aspect of jo of God do we see in Romans chapter 5 here? Love. Okay, we see his love. That's an attribute. Very much. We see his love. Now, his love plays into the bigger spot here. The sacrifice. Okay, he's loving. He's sacrificial. He is our... Propitiation, wonderful big word. Not what I'm looking for, but a very good word because he is. And it's all tied up with this. It, you're all dancing all over it. Well, it says God did it in his time. Okay. In his sovereign time, it's too simple. Savior. savior. There we go. Lisa gets it finally. He is our savior. He, he can't be our savior without being our propitiation. He can't be our savior without being love. He can't be our savior without sacrificing. without sacrificing, but it all boils down to, he is our savior and worshiping. I'm shaking the table. Okay. And worshiping God as our savior. How is that going to affect, improve our marriages? We have to know that there's always somebody above Okay, we're recognizing his authority. Okay. 
this is a little bit trickier one, but I'll let you I'll let you work around on it because there's lots of good thinking to do here. We're all sinners in need of savior. We're all sinners in need of a savior. Worshiping God, Kevin got it beat me to it. I did fast there. Okay. I thought you were gonna have to work harder at it. <laughs> As a human, I need a savior. My wife needs a savior. You know what that means? It goes back to what we said before. The person, in, the person, in, <laughs> the person that you entered into the covenant of companionship with is a sinner. And they need grace, just like you do. They need forgiveness, just like you do. And we're going we're gonna to dwell on forgiveness with one of the commitments that he wants us to make later. But nothing, here's another key one, okay? You need a savior. What did you do? What is your ultimate sin against God? I mean, you've got lots of little ones, and I realize there's no like grading scale. But what is your ultimate sin against God? Not worship. Okay, not worship. You're close. You're heading in the right direction. Not trusting. Not trusting. Those are the sins that would keep us from salvation. But what sin causes us to need salvation? It's not the best way to say it. I'm probably not saying it very clearly. Disobedience. Okay, disobedience. I am responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. I'm a murderer. The death of Jesus Christ is on my conscience. Something else I've, I've heard quite a bit lately. Um, the quote is attributed to Martin Luther. I haven't looked it up any further, but he says, you killed Jesus and don't try to deny it the nails are in your pocket. We are responsible. My sin is responsible for the death of Jesus. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing that she does to me is worse than what I've done to God. Think about it. I killed his son and he offered me forgiveness. My sin is responsible for the death of Jesus. And he offers me forgiveness. Your spouse comes and says, even if they didn't, your spouse does something to hurt you horribly. And it's nothing worse than what you've done to God. And my battery just... My battery saver just kicked on, which means, I don't know, apparently I'm not smart enough to plug in a laptop or something. <laughs> oh, well. So we got to go quick. <laughs> we run out of battery power, apparently. Okay. Nothing I do, nothing that she does, nothing that your spouse does is worse than what you've done to God. We all want to look at our spouse from time to time, and I understand we're looking around this room and we're, you know, we're 18, 20, 25, 50 years. Most of us have worked through a lot of things. But even today, when your spouse does something and you think, really? They did that? That really hurt. And well, their sin against me is huge. And God says, that's nothing. They didn't nail your only son to a tree and kill him. Worshiping God as our Savior matters to our marriages because it gives us a perspective. It, these three aspects, these three worship focuses are going to play into making the six commitments. Basically, they're the how. How do we make these commitments to one another? We make them because we can worship God as our Savior, forgiver, our, the one who forgave us, okay? We, we can make these commitments because God is sovereign 
And so I can be committed to do these things because, well, God's plan is being acted out in my life. I think, oh no, wow, okay. <laughs> We are we are 54 minutes in, running out of battery power, and I don't know why, but I can't get the cord to plug in. So we're going to we're going to stop for tonight because we really are an hour on the lesson, and I don't want to keep going too too much later. Um, next month we'll come back and we'll pick up the rest of this and probably add some more to it. But the homework discussion, um, the homework discussion, and by the way. I think most everybody said, oops, I forgot about the homework. Um, try and remember it next time. Um, the homework discussion, personal contemplation, okay? Don't, don't argue this out with your spouse. Think, think about, what triggers, about what triggers your most intense reactions because it will tell you what you're truly working. If you find yourself truly worked up because of something there's an idol there okay um marriage discussion discussion this is the two that you should try to discuss try to honestly discuss an area where you think you may have been selfish with your spouse in that you were you were worse oh um selfishness comes in um Okay, both marriage discussions actually come in the second part of this lesson, so we'll have to table the homework discussions. But spend some time, try to spend some time looking at what do you get upset about? Because we got some pretty mellow people here, but there is something that triggers you. Somewhere along the line, something triggers you. Think about that and look at what that idol is because that's going to cause a problem in your marriage. You're not worshiping God in that part of your life is what I'm saying. Okay. I will pause. I will stop the video. Um,